Reaching your weight loss goals is great, but if you're left with extra skin you don't need anymore, that can be a problem. We'll talk about surgical options later in the show. And after a heart attack, it would be great to have a guardian angel watching over the patient to warn if there's another heart attack coming. Well, doctors are experimenting with a device that can do just that. Hello and welcome to 12 to Your Health. I'm your host, Dr. Derek De Silva. Over one million Americans suffer from heart attacks every year, and over 400,000 will die as a result. Every minute saved in getting heart attack patients to the ER increases their chances of survival. My next guest is here to tell us about an experimental device that warns patients they're having a heart problem before they have any symptoms. Dr. Archana Patel is a cardiologist and clinical assistant professor at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital and Medical School. Also joining us is Suzette Pickett. She suffered a massive heart attack with atypical symptoms earlier this year. Thank you ladies, both of you, for joining us. Thank it's great to have you. Here. So let's start with you, Dr. Patel. You know, we talk about heart attacks. We talk about the frequency of heart attacks. 400 to 600,000 people die every year. It's still the number one killer, isn't it? Yes, it is. So wh what are we doing about this? Risk factors, what are some of the more common risk factors, just very quickly, for heart disease? So the most common risk factors are age, diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and patients that have had a previous heart attack are at probably the highest risk for having a recurrent heart attack. S Approximately 5% of patients that have had previous heart attacks have a repeat heart attack. Now we talk about atypical symptoms. We've talked about the difference in presentation of symptoms with men and women. What was different about Suzette and what happened to her? So Suzette came in to the emergency room and she had not the severe crushing chest pain that most people think that they should have when they have a heart attack, which is most common in patients with diabetes as well as women who present either with just shortness of breath, a little bit of heartburn, and think they have, you know, right. not a heart attack, and then ignore it for your hours at a time until it's probably too late. Right. Suzette, what happened? What, what were you doing? Uh, it was earlier this year. What, what happened? And give us a rundown on that. Well, I was in the ER and um, I was... Before you got to the emergency room, what happened? Oh, um, well, actually, I was going to the hospital for something else. Um, I, I was having um, pains in my gastrointestinal. Okay. And um, when I was being, um, when I was getting ready to have surgery, um, I had coded in the emergency room, so I had had a heart attack. And come to find out I had 95% blocked art, yeah. left artery blocked. Right. Now, this is something that I see, I've seen this quite a few times in my own practice, where, in fact, I had a patient just the other day who was having some, you know, some gastric reflux, GI problems, and this was a man, but he also was short of, we had some shortness of breath going upstairs, etc. Ordered a stress test, stress test was abnormal, he's going for catheterization. How often do you see that? Very often. It, it is common that patients have no symptoms and have coronary disease that has been undiagnosed until they go to a physician for something else and it's picked up incidentally. All right, All right so let's talk about this new device. Uh, tell me a little bit about this. By the way, when did you have the device implanted, Suzette? Uh, May 30th. So May, and you've had this for a couple of months. Three months a couple yes. of months. Tell us a little bit about this, and we have some pictures that we're going to show, so let's take a look at these pictures first. Is, is this the device? Yes, this is the Angel Med Guardian device that looks like a pacemaker. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is implanted just like a pacemaker with a wire that goes into the heart that acts like the antenna and is constantly monitoring the heart. Okay. And, and this then... is hooked up to an external device that is the warning device for the patient so yes. that when the device picks up abnormal signals, it will alert the patient in three ways. Okay. By vibrating within the chest wall. So the device will vibrate within the chest wall. So this device yes. will vibrate in the chest wall, okay. Yes, and then also communicate with this external device, which will start to beep. Go ahead. You, as I well as flash the alarm. There's so an alarm on there? Yes. Okay, so that would go off. 
just like that. And they will be able to see the flashing red light also, that, you know, which will say, go to the emergency room. <laughs> but, but tell me what's going on there that the person, that this thing is actually working. Well, let, let's go through this diagram. You can shut that thing off. Yes. Uh, let's go through this uh, diagram right here. What, what's happening here? So what's happening is that the device is implanted within the chest wall, just right. like a pacemaker. The wire goes through a vein that goes to the bottom of the heart uh -huh. and is constantly monitoring, monitoring the heart signals 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. If it sees any changes within the signal that is in the heart, it will automatically record it and transmit it to this external device so that the patient is warned to say something is not right, go to the emergency So room. what it's picking up then, is it an abnormal rhythm or is it picking up something more than that? It's picking up changes in the ST segments, which is right. indicates either uh, a heart attack with occluded blood vessel, if you see ST segment elevation, or depression, which says you have ischemia, wow. go to the emergency room. Wow. Yeah. Now, Suzette, has this thing gone off on you um, since you've had it implanted? Yes, I've, I've had the see doctor warn me this. And um, uh, when I get nervous or right. excited, um, it, it's programmed that it makes it, it, uh -huh. it feels that change and it will go off. And okay. then I. D don't get too excited here, okay. please. <laughs> okay. <Yes. laughs> we don't want you getting too. Well, okay. fortunately, we have the cardiologist <laughs> yes. here, so she can handle I'll it. I'll take care of her. Yeah. She, so, so when that happens here, uh, Dr. Patel, what what does she need to do? She gets to the emergency room. You get there, and, and what happens? And then we do standard of care, whatever we would normally do for a patient that presents with chest pain, which mm -hmm. is do a cardiogram, do blood tests do uh, an EKG right away to make sure that the mm -hmm. patient is not having an acute heart attack. Now, is this the future? Is this the future of, of what's going to happen with heart disease? And also, what about people who don't have symptoms or people who are at high risk? Are they candidates for this? Yes. So the people that have coronary disease have had previous heart attacks or bypass surgery and are at high risk, which is the diabetics, right. people with renal, uh, mm -hmm. kidney, uh, problems, mm -hmm. um, they are candidates for right. this device. And the goal is to get the patient to the emergency room sooner with before they have any symptoms so that we can make that time where we talk right. about time is muscle sure. and door to balloon time of 90 minutes. We can make that 90 minutes, but we still have to get the patient to the ER within the first two hours of right. a heart attack. So the sooner the better, the, the earlier sooner. the better is the whole yeah. thing. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Great information. Give thank us an update in the near future. Well, do. If we have updates on this, and good luck to you, young lady. Thank you, Doctor. You're not nervous, so right? No. You're good? Deep breathe? <laughs> there you go. Okay. Thank you once again for joining us. Thank you. Folks, stay with us on 12 Day Health. I'll answer a viewer question about acidophilus, how much you should be taking. And one of New Jersey's biggest losers has a lot of extra skin to lose after getting in shape. We'll find out how it's done. But first, your health bite of the week, a light snack of complex carbs and protein at least an hour before bed can lead to better sleep. Hello and welcome to 12 to Your Health. I'm your host, Dr. Derek De Silva. You know, it's a huge accomplishment when an obese person can lose 100 pounds and get down to a healthy weight. But then that person has another problem to deal with, and that is excess skin. Excess skin can cause discomfort, irritation, and it's actually added weight that can only be removed through surgery. My next guest performed plastic surgery on Amanda Arlauskas from season eight of The Biggest Loser after she lost 100 pounds. Amanda's looking great in a bikini now, thanks to Dr. Brian Glatt. Dr. Glatt is a board certified plastic surgeon who practices at Mar Marstown Medical Center. Dr. Glatt, welcome back to the program. Well, thank you for having me. My pleasure. So uh, when, we, when we talk about this type of surgery, is there a magic number of weight loss that people have to have in order for you to do these cosmetic procedures? 
That's a great question, and a lot of people ask that. There's really no magic number. It's very much a relative thing. It really depends on what people come in with and how they present to me. Um, people having this kind of surgery sometimes have a weight loss in the order of 60 to 70 pounds, but I've also operated on people that have a weight loss on the order of 200 pounds. So it really depends on the physical manifestation of their weight loss and their, and their uh, process and their, um, you know, how they present to me sure. at the time. Now, I, I also mentioned in there that there are issues with discomfort, irritation, infection yes. is another one that we didn't talk about because of the, of, of the excess skin. Just talk to us about that and what people can do if they do have that. I think one of the biggest problems with it, the medical, the biggest medical problems with it, is something we called intertrigo, which is a skin, a severe skin irritation that occurs in the folds of the skin with this kind of weight loss. Uh, folds of skin develop and that skin is not exposed to the air or the outside world it gets kind of damp it gets kind mm -hmm. of nasty and can cause true infectious complications yeah we have some pictures can you just maybe just go through sure. these with us Happy as to. we as we present them uh, we have some before and after this is the go ahead before this is and after. this is Amanda um, after her uh, stint on the biggest loser where she uh, was a third finalist uh, her season, she was a big fan favorite too. Anyone that's met her could understand why. She lost about 110 pounds, I believe, at that point. And one thing that Amanda is very quick to point out is just how much the spandex clothing covers up yeah. the folds of skin. Right. And, and this is Amanda when she first presented to me uh, approximately one year ago. And that's a partial picture, obviously, uh, for the sake of television. Mm -hmm. But you can see the folds of skin developing underneath the bikini, even right. around the belly button, right. how much wow. the folds of skin um, really occur. Uh -huh. And then this is, wow. And this is Amanda. <laughs> Thank you. That's good work. Thank you very much. This is Amanda postoperatively, and this is her postoperative only three months. So she actually had a lot more healing to go since this point. You can see her scar is still a teeny bit red around her belly button. And the nice thing about this surgery is we can keep the scar very low, well underneath, well beyond uh, where the underwear typically will right. cover it up. Right. So she does have a scar that wraps all the way around her body. And there she is trying on her very first bikini. And Amanda nice. posted that picture to Facebook on her own uh, without any uh, foresight, by, uh, by without letting us know at all. Mm -hmm. Advance, and it was a thrill to see it. Wow. It really was. That is amazing. Now, you know, when, when we look at stuff <laughs> like this, is there, is, there a, is there a time when the surgery should be done, the cosmetic procedure should be done? That's another great question, and people ask about that all the time. One of the things that I like to ask patients is when they come in having had a lot of weight loss, the first thing I ask them is, well, is your weight stable? Mm -hmm. And if it has been stable, how long has it been stable for? I personally like to see their weight stable somewhere in the order of six months, just to know that they don't necessarily have more weight to lose. Or on the other hand, if they're not going to yo-yo back up. Right. It is a mindset. It is a lifestyle change. And Amanda would be the first one to tell you that. Well, that was my next question to you is what if they regain the weight? What happens? It's a problem. Um, after surgery, you can regain weight. That's one of the things I do talk to patients about. So it's really up to me to be very selective about who gets this surgery. Mm -hmm. You certainly don't want to put someone in the position to take the risk and the cost and the time and everything else that's involved with surgery just to have them go back and gain a lot of weight. Right. So there's psychological evaluations that sometimes occur as well. Not in everybody, but some for some of the more severe cases. But it's very important that people do maintain an, a, uh, the healthy weight uh, preoperatively for a certain period of time. Again, uh, drawbacks. Is there, are there, is there any down to this type of a procedure? It is a downside. Big, it is a big procedure. It does require an in-house hospitalization. How um, long does it typically take for you to do this operation? The procedure itself takes about six hours wow. uh, by myself. And um, like I said, it does take one to two nights overnight in the hospital. Amanda stayed one night. Many patients will stay two. Uh, it used to require a lot of blood transfusions and things like that, but we've mm -hmm. really gotten better at doing the surgery, and it's very rare, if ever, that someone would require a blood transfusion these right. days for a procedure like Amanda's. Recovery time? Six weeks. Six weeks until someone's really back to being active again, running around, exercising. And that's one of the hard things for these patients. Right, They've right. gotten used to diet and exercise, and now I tell them, hey, you can't do your exercise routine for six weeks. And that's very difficult. So, and then, you know, I, you, the thing that you mentioned that really struck me is the psychological evaluation. 
you don't do that on everybody? Well, I don't personally perform that. If I think, if I get a sense that someone isn't necessarily quite ready for this mm -hmm. or doesn't understand everything involved, I will refer them to somebody who's more uh, trained in doing that. Of course, I get a certain sense of it myself, and being a part-time psychologist is part of my job, too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but but um, there are professionals which can evaluate people, and a lot of the weight loss clinics that are involved in them getting uh, people getting surgery, now not in Amanda's case, but other mm -hmm. people, do involve psychological evaluation in the first place. Big question here, insurance okay. issue, insurance coverage. Do they, don't they? Sometimes yes, most of the time no. Always very difficult regardless. Uh, in cases of true intertrigo skin irritation, uh, documentation that you just can't lose more weight because of the physical limitations, right. those things are going to stand a very good chance. Someone that has lost a lot of weight, done hard work, and sometimes Fortunately, sure. unfortunately, doesn't have those things, it's going to be an uphill battle, but it can be done. Very good. Thank you for the great information. Thank you for joining us. Always again. a pleasure. Thank you. Very good. Folks, stay with us when we come back. I'll answer your email questions. But first, here's a look at this week's community health calendar. You're watching 12 to your health on News 12 New Jersey. I'm Dr. Derek De Silva. Time now to answer some of your health questions. And this one comes from Ed, who's 64 years of age. And he asks, I'm wondering about acidophilus. How much CFU or colony forming units should I take each day? And am I getting enough in my yogurt? Well, first of all, you're not getting enough in your yogurt. You would have to eat about six or seven, maybe even more yogurts a day to get the really, if you will, therapeutic amount of acidophilus or the good bacteria. Don't recommend that. I really don't recommend that because of the amount of sugar that there is in yogurt. If you're eating the plain yogurt, fine, I don't have a problem with that. If you're looking for a probiotic or the good bacteria, or another word is acidophilus, what you have to look at here is how much that you need to take. First of all, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 colony count units are fine. I don't have a problem with that. New technology today, there's microencapsulation, so you need less. Look at the directions, look at the bottle, follow the directions on the bottle, and I think that's the best way to go. Around between 20 and 50,000 colony units is the best way to go. And folks, if you have any questions for me, please email them to 12 to Health at news12.com, and I'll answer them right here on the show. If you'd like to find out more about anything we've discussed on our show today, go to 12 to Health show page in the Features section of news12.com. And once again, keep those questions coming. Looking forward to answering them. Thank you very much for watching 12 to Health. Until next time, I'm Dr. Derek De Silva, and may you always be blessed with good health.